thank you very much for that lovely introduction and for the very kind invitation to speak at this symposium. It's the third time I've spoken in Taiwan on this topic, and I've always really enjoyed the very rich, detailed, uh, in-depth discussion. Taiwan really is a global leader in the field of chemsex, helped very much by the efforts of Dr. Stefan, Dr. Carol, Dr. Puyao, uh, Dr. Jowan, uh, Dr. Peter, and many others. And it's a real privilege to work alongside such accomplished colleagues. 2023 marks 10 years since the first academic article emerged that utilized the term chemsex. It's a term that originated in the community and it's evolved over time and across countries and contexts. But no matter the term used to describe the phenomenon, it's evoked a considerable amount of attention from community members, researchers, public health officials, the media, and politicians. The 10 years have witnessed hundreds of research papers and reports relating to chemsex. There's been papers that look at the practice of chemsex, papers that seek to define what it is and what it isn't, papers um, that seek to measure it in a myriad of ways, and ones that look at patterns in risk and in consequences. And we've responded to it in clinical settings, in online settings, and in community-based organizations. I'm going to try and piece together some of these elements during my talk this morning and try to think through the things we can say with confidence on the back of this research and the things that are left to be said, the, the key questions for the next 10 years. At previous Asia-Pacific um, chemsex symposiums in 2018 and 19, we spent a lot of time talking about what chemsex is, the context of chemsex, and what it involves. So I'm going to jump forwards and talk more so at first about prevalence and patterns and what we've learned about these in the last 10 years. How commonplace is it and among whom? Now the answer to that question depends very much on how you ask the question. It's been a really big challenge to establish the prevalence of chemsex and to compare from one context to the next, given the wildly differing ways in which it's been assessed. As a starting point, are we talking about um, measuring chemsex specifically or drugs used during sex more broadly? What definition is provided to participants about chemsex? Are we assessing engagement in the last three months, the last six months, the last 12 months or ever? Is it the use of certain drugs in general or their use only in certain settings? Where we ask the question as well, also significantly influences perceptions of prevalence, with much higher rates of use reported in, clinic, in certain clinic-based samples. If we take a very brief tour around the world, we can see indications of chemsex prevalence, although the fact it's, asked, it's often asked so differently makes it challenging to compare prevalence in one context to the next. An online community survey of MSM in Australia in 2019 found that 14% had used crystal methamphetamine in the last six months. A survey of countries of the British Isles in 2018 asked MSM when they last used crystal methamphetamine, mephidrome, GHB, and ketamine, respectively. 18% had used one or more of uh, these drugs at some point in their lives. 8.2% in the last 12 months and 3% in the last four weeks. A very different way of establishing prevalence than has been the case in other countries. A survey I ran with colleagues in 2019 of more than 12,000 MSM across 54 countries of Europe found that 6.8% had used either crystal meth, GHB or mephidrome within the previous three months, but we didn't specifically ask about the context of use. Data from the American Men's Internet Survey of more than 30,000 MSM, 10.3% had used crystal meth or GHB or ecstasy in the previous three months. And this is the first time that we started to see ecstasy included um, in a chemsex-related framing. And finally, in Canada, where data from an online survey of 6,000 men uh, found 6.2% had used stimulant drugs in general, to make sex last longer or feel more intense in the last four weeks without making reference to the specific drugs. All of these studies have added a great deal to our understanding, but they've also introduced a lot of complexity in terms of how prevalent chemsex is given the different ways it's been asked about. 
Every attempt I've seen at performing a meta-analysis across countries has largely failed because given this huge diversity that I've tried to illustrate. What we can say is that somewhere in the region of 5 to 15% of MSM may engage in chemsex on a regular basis, so at least every three to six months, but that is a pretty rough estimate. These surveys also tend to paint a common picture of who is most likely to engage in chemsex. We repeatedly see evidence that it's more common among HIV positive men, about three to five times more likely. Those living in major urban centers, Bangkok, New York, London, Taipei, and those engaging in sex work. Moving us along a little bit, we come to the question of why, what motivates some gay, bisexual, and other MSM to engage in chemsex? And this has been the subject of a lot of speculation over the last 10 years. And often I think the answer has been framed in ways that pathologize gay men's sexual lives. It is the case that for some gay men, Chemsex is a reaction to internalized homophobia, people using drugs as a means of distancing, uh, overcoming or distancing themselves from shame they feel for being gay or shame they feel about being HIV positive or because of concerns about their body or other issues. And in this case, using drugs helped them to overcome a problem that they were having with sex. But what really emerges time and time again over the last 10 years is the central role of pleasure in chemsex. Yes, it's the case that some men are using drugs to overcome or mitigate certain negative forces, but the most salient, significant, and commonly reported reason for using drugs is that they facilitate sexual pleasure. I particularly like this quote from a researcher called Rusty Sulemanyov um, in Canada, which he and his colleagues wrote in 2019. And he encourages us in this paper to think about why chemsex emerged as a phenomenon at the point it did in around 2012 or 2013. And they say, the transition from condom-centered prevention to today's context, context where new highly effective biomedical tools for HIV prevention are available, created possibilities for greater intimacy, increased pleasure, and less anxiety about HIV transmission, while challenging years of preventative socialization among gay and bisexual men. Essentially, what they're saying here is that this new biomedical era shaped an environment in which this kind of sexual expression and adventure feels more possible than it once did. That's not the same as saying that it's caused chemsex, but it has shaped or reshaped the environment within which chemsex can happen. But despite everything I've said about pleasure, um, there are risks, and there are harms, and there are consequences, and to not acknowledge that would be a disservice to those who sometimes require our support or intervention. The harms come in many different forms, and across the world, perhaps most especially in Asia and the Pacific, we've been particularly concerned about the possibility that chemsex may be associated with HIV or STI incidents. There have been more than 80 published studies where data about drug use in sexual contexts is captured alongside data about HIV and STI diagnoses. Fortunately, these have been the subject of two robust systematic reviews, the second of those on the screen um, I was involved with. And they both tell quite a clear and relatively convincing story. Without question, there is an association between enge engaging in chemsex and having received an STI diagnosis in the last three, six, or 12 months, anywhere between two and five times more likely than those not engaging in chemsex. I think from my perspective, this has always been a matter of mathematics. Chemsex allows you to have sex for longer. It maintains you in a state of arousal in which you can have sex with more people, possibly in quick succession. When there's a high um, coverage of PrEP use and undetectable viral load among participants, so the likelihood of condom use is lower. And these combined are the ideal circumstances for the transmission of STIs, particularly bacterial ones. When it comes to chemsex and HIV though, I'm still not as convinced on the basis of 10 years of data that in high income contexts, there is a clear relationship between engaging in chemsex and risk practices that result in HIV seroconversion certainly not on a large scale. High levels of undetectable viral load in the community of people living with HIV, 
coupled with very high rates of PrEP use among men engaging in chemsex. Some of the highest rates of PrEP use you see are among those men engaging in chemsex. Means that the likelihood of HIV transmission in most high-income countries with good coverage of biomedical prevention technologies is likely rather low. What's very different, however, in many countries across Asia and the Pacific is the coverage of biomedical prevention technologies. In countries such as Malaysia, Indonesia, Vietnam, and others, access to and engagement with PrEP is still comparatively low, and at the same time, community load can be high. In Indonesia, for example, where HIV prevalence among MSM is as high as 18%, and where only 38% may be on treatment, the potential for HIV transmission in a context of high partner turnover and prolonged sexual sessions is very high. That is all to say, that the local dynamics of chemsex and HIV in each country are shaping very different outcomes. At present though, we simply don't have longitudinal studies where there is sufficient data of a high enough quality to be able to establish the role of chemsex in seroconversion with certainty, partly due to all of those issues of measurement and case definition that I spoke to a moment ago. But our HIV-related concern rightly extends beyond seroconversion to also include ART adherence for those already diagnosed positive. And in this respect, there has been quite a change in the literature over the last 10 years. Back in 2014 and 15, several studies on the relationship between chemsex and ART adherence reported no negative association. However, moving forward to within the last two years, we have seen several examples of studies where ART use among those engaging in chemsex was suboptimal compared to those who didn't use drugs during sex. The second example on the screen here was a study I worked on with colleagues in Europe across four different countries where we examined chemsex among patients at HIV positive clinics. More than twice as many men engaging in chemsex had missed ART doses compared to those hasn't compared to those who hadn't, a pattern that was mirrored in the study from London at the top of the screen there as well. But before we all start to worry about this, these particular findings, it's worth noting that in neither study was there an association with viral load detectability, indicating that the reduced adherence was not so protracted or long-lasting as to negatively impact their overall HIV clinical outcomes. There are, of course, a range of other potential harms to be mindful of in the context of chemsex, and lots of these have been documented over the last 10 years. I'll talk first to mental health. Crystal methamphetamine can trigger intense feelings of sexual arousal, but overuse can be associated with paranoia, irritability, or psychosis, either from the drug effects themselves or the ensuing come down. There are an increasing number of case reports and qualitative studies describing this experience. However, it's worth noting that at the level of global association between chemsex, drug use, and mental health, there is a very mixed picture. While some studies have reported that those engaging in chemsex have worse mental health outcomes than those who don't, other studies, including two I've been involved with in Australia, don't reflect that association. Indeed, Field and his colleagues uh, this year reported how engagement in chemsex was associated with lower odds of anxiety and depression. The authors were at pains to say that they aren't proposing chemsex as a remedy to poor mental health, but rather they hypothesize that something about the social connectedness of chemsex and the often very dense social networks that people are embedded within when they engage in chemsex may act as a protective factor for mental health which is supported by a range of qualitative studies as well. There are a range of other um, potential harms, and I'm not gonna go through them all in detail. Um, risks of overdose, damage to relationships, financial costs, legal consequences, risk of assault. These have all been um, widely documented in the last 10 years and the subject um, of a few different reviews that I've referenced at the bottom of the page. Complicating our response to all of these issues has been stigma. Stigma has been directed towards people who use drugs across our societies for many decades, and this is just as true of people engaging in chemsex. 
And with all types of stigma, it can act as a barrier to people seeking or providing help when it's needed. As I hope I've made clear, this compelling evidence that using drugs to enhance or facilitate sex is often highly valued by many MSM. I'm cautious about pathologizing everything about the sexual lives of this population, and I don't believe that chemsex is inherently problematic. It can be affirming and pleasurable. But for some people, it does become a problem. They do experience harm, and as has been particularly evident in relation to crystal meth use and GHB. Understanding the circumstances of harm is crucial if we're to design and deliver support to those who need it. I think we can do much better in terms of understanding and reflecting the continuum of chemsex experiences. What I'm presenting here is a general sense of what that continuum could look like, drawn from 10 years of research in this space and reviewing dozens of articles in the field, although I'm sure it requires considerable nuancing. And it does draw on some of the work that Tom Plateau and colleagues did in Europe um, two or three years ago. Much of the public and media attention has been fixed at the far end uh, of, this, of this continuum. People who are in form, some form of crisis. These are people who are really having it tough. They're in acute mental health circumstances. They may have overdosed repeatedly. They may be isolated from the very support that they would benefit from. But most research indicates most people find themselves further to the left of the screen. They're using drugs during sex for very specific purposes at specific times. They're considered about the drugs they use and how they use them, but sometimes that shifts and changes. Come downs become worse, a preoccupation can develop, it can become challenging to have or even imagine sex without using drugs. My goal in suggesting such a continuum isn't to suggest that everyone is destined to move from the left to the right. This isn't an inevitable journey, but rather to illustrate some of the signifiers of when chemsex may be becoming problematic, to encourage questions that could be asked of clients and service users, to establish the nature of their relationships with chemsex, and to understand and affirm the value people may derive, while at the same time, staying attentive to signals that external support may be required. In my last section, I'll turn attention to some of the interventions that have been deployed to reduce harms associated with chemsex if they occur. I hope my Taiwanese colleagues, uh, Dr. Carol, Dr. Jawan, Dr. Puyao, Dr. Stefan, don't mind me showing this excellent diagram that they recently developed for a paper published in The Lancet HIV. It seeks to outline the various harm reduction strategies people can employ before the chemsex session, which is shown in the green font, during the chemsex session in the red font, and after the chemsex session in the blue font. The Venn diagram shows drug use at the top, HIV management on the left, and sexual health management more broadly on the right. We hope it provides a valuable summary for both clinical and community practitioners and assists with both service planning and community level harm reduction education. There's a role here for pre-consideration and discussion of sexual preferences, of personal self-care, and for education and empowerment, and a big role for biomedical prevention technologies. An important aspect of chemsex to hold in mind is that it often takes place within relatively dense, sometimes quite well-connected social networks, and these provide great opportunities for dissemination of harm reduction information and materials. There are a wide range of interventions that have been deployed across the world. Group work, therapeutic interventions, peer-based education, community mobilization efforts, some of which I know we'll hear about later this morning. Everything from film production to chemsex poetry evenings, party planning, and more besides. And the utility or the role of each of these depends upon which of the many potential harms you're trying to address. One of our own community organizations in Australia recently reviewed evidence about drug use interventions for gay and bisexual men and drew out five key principles they propose should inform all such work. Some of these are very familiar to us, but they serve as a timely reminder that drug interventions need to hold at their core the goals that individuals want to work towards. They need to be led by their preferences, be that for more managed use or abstinence. The intervention needs to recognize that not all MSM are the same and that intersectionality shapes experience and outlook. Interventions must be sex positive. 
They must be designed with community and where possible recognize the role that family and friends can play in efforts to better manage drug use. We are starting to see some of these interventions evaluated, although such research is still in its very early stages. I've only seen one RCT of a chemsex intervention anywhere in the world, recently published from colleagues um, close to us in Hong Kong, where their focus was on condom use and HIV testing following the intervention. Other evaluated studies are focused on therapeutic interventions where methamphetamine use is considered and where the outcome assessed is alignment with person-centered treatment goals relating to more carefully managed use. And such evaluations have shown promise. When considering the challenges associated with chemsex, there's a similar pattern of issues that has been evident all across the world. Challenges in inefficient client pathways, inadequately designed services, restrictive, or funding, um, restrictive funding environments where the sexual health funders think it's a drug problem and the drug funders think it's a sexual health problem, um, inadequate social um, psychological support, mental health practitioners not understanding the circumstances of chemsex um, or the cultural context of gay men's lives. I hope this talk has provided uh, an overview of where we've got to in the last 10 years, but there's always a great deal more to do. And in closing, I want to highlight just a few key areas that I feel warrant further attention in the next 10 years of chemsex research. It will remain a considerable challenge to accurately understand the prevalence and patterns of chemsex without establishing some standardized data collection tools. And this is something I'm especially keen to work on next. As I hope I've made clear, not all gay men engage in chemsex and not all men who do engage in chemsex experience problems, but some do. And I think we're not as sophisticated as we need to be in understanding when and for whom this may be the case. Research that more carefully and examines problematic use is sorely needed. At an international level, I think research is needed to help understand how legislative policy and cultural environments shape engagement in chemsex, and the delivery of harm reduction interventions. With some of the world's most complex and sometimes punitive legal environments around drug use, Asia and the Pacific is an obvious place to conduct such work. Understanding safe supply of drugs in chemsex is still in its infancy. There's much more to do here, given the key role that drug quality can play in shaping harmful outcomes. And now is the time to evaluate. We've witnessed so many amazing, creative, and I'm sure likely impactful interventions from community organizations and in clinical settings. But evaluation of this work has been extremely limited. Without more robust evaluation of therapeutic interventions, of community-based and online interventions, and broader harm reduction interventions, we lack the evidence base that is required to inform the design and the funding of services and programs at the scale that is required. All of these things still hold value in the next 10 years. We can and should build a richer picture of the chemsex experience, but if we're to single out one for special attention, it would be evaluation. Thank you very much for your attention. It's been a pleasure. Xie Xie.